gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We'll keep some silence and then kneel if you are able. As we say together, Almighty and most merciful, merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We may have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And then apart from your grace, there is, there is no help in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And may grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. So I say to you, Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Grant to your faithful people, merciful Lord, pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
which were before you, since the day that God created man and earth, and ask of one end of the heaven to the other, whether such a great thing as that has ever happened, was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take the nation for himself from the midst of another nation, by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other beside him. Out of heaven he made you hear his voice, that he might discipline you. And out of earth he made you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose your offspring after them, and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving before you the nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you and to give you their lands for the inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore you should keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you to do. That it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that your Lord God is giving you for all time. Glory to God. Thanks be to God. The epistle is written in the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning in verse 1. 
beginning at the 26th verse. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated on his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip, Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? <clears throat> And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Timothy's, if at quarter two you are wondering, where's that priest? <laughs> so was I. <laughs> Thankfully, my wife was driving, so um, there was a little, little more calmness in our vehicle than there might have been. Um, but in God's good time, we arrived despite the rollover crash on Highway One. But I pray that the person who experienced that is okay. We commend them to God. So, I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Now, when I was last with you, I used an illustration from The Lord of the Rings. Well done. Uh, by J.R.R. Tolkien. Today, I open with a line that appears on the first page of every single volume of the Wheel of Time series, a sprawling epic written by the author that many consider to be not only Tolkien's American successor, but his most true and worthy successor. His name is Robert Jordan. At another time, I'd be happy to sing his praises. But the line is this. It was not the beginning, but it was a beginning. It was not the beginning, but it was a beginning. And today marks for me the second of four beginnings here with you at St. Timothy's. You know, the first was uh, when I preached and officiated a few months ago. And in case some of you don't know this, and there's no reason for you to know, um, but I'm going to let you know today, I had applied for the open position on the deadline day, <laughs> December 31st. I'd been praying about it and, and seeking counsel about it, and right in the middle of the Christmas break, I said, Lord, unless you stop my fingers somehow, I'm going to go ahead with this and see where the Lord takes us. Well, that brings us uh, to the first day I ministered among you, and I felt welcomed and comfortable and a few of you suggested I ought to apply for the open rector position, to which I replied with uh, responses such as, I'll talk to my wife about it, or thank you, I'll link into that. I wanted to do right by the selection committee, which was, was doing right by you, doing an excellent job in, um, in sussing out candidates. And so here we are today, a few days shy of four months following my application. And I want to assure you that God has been at work. God is at work, and God will continue to be at work in the life of St. Timothy's if we continue to seek his face, we continue to ask for his guidance, and we continue to walk in his ways. So today, as mentioned, it marks the second beginning on which we begin a preaching series on the Gospel of St. Mark, but more on that shortly. Then on June 1st, we will mark yet another beginning, a third beginning, if you will, for on that day, I will begin here as your rector in real time. And on June, July 6th, we will mark a fourth and final beginning when Bishop Mike Stewart joins us to formally install, in, formally install me as rector. So, a series of four beginnings uh, for your fourth rector. And I feel privileged and humbled to become the fourth rector of a parish that features such continuity in its parishioners. Those of you who are chartered members, I won't ask you to raise your hands. You've seen much over these years. I know you have lost much, much that you could probably describe in great detail and with many tears. But I wonder if you know that you have also gained much over those years, some of which will only be known in the hindsight of heaven. So, to our text, and four is also the number of the Gospels in the New Testament of Holy Scripture, Year B in our lectionary, which falls in this year, the year of our Lord, 2024. And it features passages from the Gospel of St. Mark, almost for the entire year. And as I prayerfully considered what the Lord would have me speak to you about this Saturday and subsequent Saturdays, I just couldn't shake the sense that I was to be guided by the lectionary in embarking upon a series in St. Mark's Gospel. Uh, that wasn't a total surprise to me. I often thought that St. Mark's would be the first I would preach through in a parish where I 
responsibility uh, for the majority of the preaching. Um, it's my name, after all. I feel an affinity with him. Um, this, this is in contrast to a famous contemporary preacher, uh, you might know his name, John MacArthur, um, who began preaching through the Gospel of St. Mark only 40 years after he had begun his ministry at Grace Community Church. In fact, it was the final book of the New Testament that he preached through. Then uh, there is a singular example of the Church of England vicar George Petter of Breed in East Sussex, who taught through the Gospel of St. Mark's in weekly meetings, albeit not Sunday services, get this, more or less continuously from June 1618 until May 1643. <laughs> Do the math. I promise that in the Gospel of Mark, I will not take 25 years or 25 months. Um, but we ought to ask why Reverend Petter saw fit to devote so many years to the expositing of the shortest of the Gospels. Yes, Mark, I agree. The main answer is the very reason that our own Lion of Liverpool, the right Reverend J.C. Ryle, gives in his preface to his own exposition of the Gospel of St. Mark, and that is, there's been a distinctive lack of attention paid to Mark's Gospel throughout the millennia of church history that was unwarranted and mistaken. Mark wasn't simply a source text for the other Gospels. He didn't simply come before, nor was Mark's Gospel bits and pieces excerpted from the three Gospels later on. No, we owe it to Mark and the God who inspired Mark to write that Gospel to pay attention to his Gospel. And finally, to round out the explanation of my choice of text, and I should mention here that I'm cracking open the door into my sermon preparation today just as sort of a get to know me, in case you're wondering who is this guy? Who is this guy who's going to be talking to us for the Gospel of St. Mark for the next 25 years? No, no, no. I promise. Not that long. Well, two recent events put punctuation marks on my sense that we should delve the depths of this Gospel. One was a meeting I had with Father Richard Sandlin um, about a week and a day ago in his new stopping grounds at Douglas College. Long story short, we had both tentatively planned for studies in St. Mark. It's by the mouth of two or three witnesses. There you go. Uh, the second was the high feast day on Thursday, this past Thursday, that totally caught me by surprise. Maybe I shouldn't be admitting that. Usually, the feast days are things that I'm up on. I'm tracking the calendar. I'm watching to see what's coming. St. Mark's feast day caught me totally by surprise. Now I'm making changes in my employment at Bible College. I'm winding down my ministry at my current parish. I'm cajoling my students to finish up their work at the end of the semester. St. Mark caught me off guard. But it also totally underscored my plan to begin preaching through his gospel. So without further ado, here we are at the first chapter and the first verse of St. Mark. That's the entirety of my text this morning. And what a journey together this will be. So please stand if you are able for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Well, we don't know as much about St. Mark as we do some other figures in Scripture. 
But what we do know of St. Mark's life story is the story of God's work in his life. And that includes the writing of the story of God's work in the world, or the beginning of it, through the early ministry of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son. That Mark did actually write the book of Mark is undisputed in all of church history, and the manuscript evidence bears it out. For the earliest manuscripts have the names of the author's headings, uh, Kata Matthion, according to Matthew, Kata Markon, according to Mark, Kata Lukon, according to Luke, and Kata Eonen, according to John. There's also no good reason to disbelieve in Mark's authorship of the book that bears his name. Now, to question who Mark was does get a little bit more confusing because, partly because, he went by two names. John was his Jewish name and Mark was his Roman name, and we call him Mark to differentiate him from John who of course had preeminence among the apostles uh, because of his proximity to Christ. Um, you recall that in, in important points of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is accompanied by just those three, Peter, James, and John. While we suspect that Mark suddenly refers to himself at a couple of points in this gospel, the first instance of John Mark named in the actual text of Holy Scripture is in Acts 12, and it is to there we now turn. Now, at this point in church history, which is synonymous with the continuing spread of the gospel to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth, the first apostle has just been martyred, about 11 years after the crucifixion of Christ. This is James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder, who has been beheaded at the hands of Herod Agrippa. And when Herod sees just how much this action pleases the Jewish leaders, he says, well, two is better than one, all the rest, Peter as well. And it tends to kill him also. But on the very night before, Herod intends to bring Peter out of the prison to have him beheaded. An angel of the Lord appears in Peter's Cell. You may remember this story. The chains binding Peter just fall away. The Roman soldiers chained on each side of Peter don't wake up. And then Peter passes by each guard and through each door without incident, without getting stopped. So he's free, and this is a miracle. And that miracle though interesting, is not going to detain us this afternoon because the most relevant information for our purposes is not where Peter has come from, the prison, but where he is going. Where is he going? Verse 12 of Acts chapter 12, he went to the house of Mary. The natural question here would be, which Mary? Of all the Marys mentioned in the New Testament, which Mary? Well, Luke, the writer of Acts, elaborates. Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathering together and praying. Now, the house is probably referred to as Mary's, likely because she was a widow. Um, but to differentiate her from all the other Marys, her son is mentioned. Again, John Mark, probably a younger man at the time. So we can infer that John Mark was among the them mentioned in verses 16 to 18 who are praying and are now beholding miraculously the Apostle Peter, whom they expected to be Peter, uh, Herod's next victim in the morning. But wait, there's more in Acts 12. More about John Mark. Between this, this acquaintance with Peter and his mother's house on, on the night that Peter's released for prison, 
Um, through the intervening months, we don't know quite how long, it was long enough for Herod to get super proud and die a disgusting death in front of an audience. Something has happened in Mark's encounter with Peter that has put him on mission. And at the end of Acts 12, after some time has gone by and Herod has died, we read two simple verses. Verses 24 and 25. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was, say it with me, Mark. <coughs> So here we have a little bit of time confusion to sort out. Where is the majority of Acts 12 set? Jerusalem. But at the end of, chapter, of the chapter, Paul and Barnabas with John Mark return to Jerusalem. So they are now in Jerusalem. So where had they been in the time between Peter's miraculous escape and Herod's disgusting death? And wherever they had gone, why would Paul and Barnabas take along John Mark? Well, for starters, there's a family connection that Paul alludes to in Colossians 4.10. Here he reveals that John Mark is Barnabas' cousin, probably his younger cousin. Barnabas knew Mark. He must have seen potential in him. He must have trusted him and vouched for him. And his usefulness seems to be proven while they're in Antioch, however long they were there. So fast forwarding another chapter later in Acts 13, when the elders at Antioch set apart Paul and Barnabas to continue the mission, to embark on the first missionary journey, Mark goes along. Although he's easy to miss for two reasons. First, he's not included in the commissioning of Paul and Barnabas. He's not one of those who are being sent out, nor is he named as one of the prophets and evangelists and teachers in Antioch. He's not named there. Secondly, when we get to verse 5 of chapter 13, he's simply referred to as John. It's easy to miss. One of his names is missing. Yet, despite those omissions, we're left with one positive indication of John Mark's calling, that of a helper. A helper. You see, John Mark had gone to assist Paul and Barnabas with whatever practical help they required. Perhaps that ability came from a Levitical background. After all, Barnabas, Mark's cousin, was a Levite, so it stands to reason that Mark was perhaps one too. And in, in this case, both Paul, uh, Barnabas and Mark would have been trained and willing and even called to assist as needed. So that's the first indication of Mark's quality of character, his usefulness, to do what's needed until he doesn't. Their departure from Antioch is when everything goes so very wrong. And it started out okay. It wasn't easy, but it was okay. So Paul and Barnabas and Mark go down to Seleucia with John Mark as their helper. That's, that's the word to, to describe this man. He's a helper. And it was tough going, there's, there's lots of travel, there's opposition, there's a magician that, that comes against them and, and tries to borrow some of their power from him, from them, and you can read this in, in Acts 13. But in Acts, in verse 13, Paul and his companions put out to sea, and at that point, John Mark leaves them. gone. 
It's a sad moment. He disappears, and we don't know why. Lots of suggestions for why. Is it homesickness, perhaps? Is it the folly of youth, perhaps? Is it lack of resilience? Whatever the cause, the word that's used for it in two places in Scripture is desertion. A deserter. John Mark deserts Paul and Barnabas. And he doesn't go back to Antioch. After all, that wouldn't have sat well with the Antiochian church that had sent him out. So he goes back to Jerusalem. He disappears for a few years. But he comes back on the scene in chapter 15. And here, Paul and Barnabas are preparing to go on a second missionary journey. A good family man that he is, who does Barnabas want to take along? John Mark. But, Paul says, Barnabas, John Mark deserted us after Antioch. But Barnabas insists that John Mark go with him, and Paul insists that John Mark not go with them. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. The discussion got so heated, it became what verse 39 calls a sharp disagreement. Trust me, those are very strong words in the Greek. Sharp disagreement. So sharp that not only is John and Paul's relationship severed, but so is Paul and Barnabas's. And they go their separate ways. Barnabas takes Mark with him to Cyprus, and Paul chooses Silas to take Barnabas' place and goes back to the churches from which they came, strengthening them and seeing how they're doing. And here is when John Mark disappears for about 10 years. 10 years. Remember that. It means something. 10 years. Now, in 10 years, he does show up again in a letter, the Colossians, a uh, letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 4. And Paul is in Rome when he writes this letter um, during his first imprisonment. And it so happens that Mark is there with Paul in Rome. There's been a reconciliation, a restoration. But we don't yet know why. And Paul writes to the Colossians, whom he loves, saying, Church, I am going to send Mark on my behalf. When he gets here, welcome him. Mark is back in the good graces of Paul. How did that happen? How does Paul now trust him to be an ambassador for him, going to a church that he planted, to act on his behalf. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Fast forward uh, to 66, 67 AD, when, when Paul is again writing a letter, but this time in his second missionary journey, is writing to Timothy this time. And he is ready to die. He has run the race. He has been faithful. He knows the time of his departure at hand, is at hand. But he's writing this last letter to Timothy. And he says to Timothy, come see me. I want you to spend some time with me in my last weeks, months on earth to encourage me. And oh, by the way, when you come, bring Mark with you. St. Paul desired the company of the one who had deserted him when he's facing his final days on earth. What a change. And the reason that Paul gives Timothy for bringing Mark is, is not only that Mark will comfort him, 
but that he is useful for ministry. There it is again. Mark's quality of, of, of helping. What a turnaround. And so, to close out my message today, I want to ask the question, what caused that turnaround? Why was Mark Deserter, who so disappointed Paul when they left Antioch to go to Seleucia, such that Paul refused to take him on the first missionary journey, when Paul was imprisoned in Rome not once but twice, why was he both comforted by in the first imprisonment and desired the company of, in the second imprisonment, that same younger man who deserted him? Well, I think it's pretty simple. In those 10 years, remember the 10 years of a gap between uh, when Barnabas and Mark went off on their own and Paul and Silas went off on their own, we know where Mark was. And we know with whom Mark was. He was with Peter. He was with Saint Peter. At least part of the time. First Peter chapter 5 tells us where Mark was, Rome, and what he was doing, at least we can infer what he was doing during that time. Now, when, when Peter is in Rome and he's writing the letter to the churches that we know as First Peter, he makes reference to Babylon, that's Rome. And he says, my son is here with me. My son? My son Mark? No, Peter doesn't have a son named Mark. This is his spiritual son, Mark. Mark is with Peter in Rome. And the consistent historical testimony of Peter in Rome is constant visiting and evangelizing of the gospel in Rome, knowing, as Paul did, that his time was short. And we have the testimony of a later writer, Eusebius, that describes Mark's activities in Rome with, with Peter as that of writing down everything Peter had said in those visits. And so, what we have in Mark's Gospel is the product of Peter's eyewitness testimony, the eyewitness accounts of the life of the Lord Jesus. Mark is given this immense and incredible privilege of writing what he calls the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So this gospel of Mark is then the true authentic work of John Mark, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The revelation concerning the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's only the beginning of the story. Only the beginning, and that's how it starts. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The very, very beginning. Amen. Amen. Can you please stand as we recite the Nicene Creed to declare our faith?
collect of the day, we pray, Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal glory, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We humbly pray that you would receive our prayers. Inspire continually, we pray, the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree to the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray at this time for those suffering the ravages of war and famine in the Ukraine. Israel, Gaza, and in many parts of Africa. We also ask that the many refugees and other displaced persons be treated with love and kindness. Our hearts and prayers are with the persecuted Christians and Jews anywhere in the world. Lord, in your mercy. In our church community, we pray for healing for Kareem, Bishop Charlie, Chris, Amy, Maddie, Jessica, and Anne. The people who we know of and are experience, experiencing difficult family situations are in need of God's loving embrace. Kimmy, Megan, and Graham. In the St. Timothy's family, we pray for Lenny Lily and Daphne Martin. We give thanks and prayers for all those who work so hard to bring God's word to us week after week here at St. Timothy's. Lord, in your mercy, we pray that those not walking with God will heed his call and come to Jesus as the two humble fishermen did who were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. We especially pray for the students and teachers at Sutherland High School who have not heeded God's call. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Churches and organizations that need your support, Lord. Living Waters, Anglican Fellowship, Fellowship, Kingston, St. Peter by the Sea, Hamilton, Deep Cove Gospel Hall, Gloria Day Lutheran, and the Table Churches in Victoria. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, giver of life, we pray that you will turn Canada into a culture that values and embraces all human life, including the most vulnerable, the preborn, the elderly, and the handicapped. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. Would you please stand as we sing hymn number 284, Thou whose Almighty Word.
So let's stand one more time to sing our final hymn, uh, verse 8 or 802, My Hope is Built. 